Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of Women in International Law Distinguished Voices interview series hosted jointly by the American Society of International Law's Women in International Law Interest Group and the Harvard International Law Journal. My name is Vera Lin, the lead executive online editor of the IOJ. It is my great honor to introduce Ms. Tracy Robinson, the 2019 recipient of uh, the Pro Prominent Women in International Law Award by ASOL. Ms. Robinson is an expert on law and policies related to gender, sexuality, and human rights, especially in the Caribbean region. She is a senior lecturer and deputy dean of the University of the West Indies Faculty of Law at Mona, Jamaica, where she co-founded and co-directs the university's Faculty of Law, UWI Rise Advocacy Project. She was also appointed a member on the independent fact-finding mission on Libya in 2020. Ms. Robinson served as commissioner on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights from 2012 to 2015, and the body's president between 2014 and 2015. There, she also served as the rapporteur on the rights of women and the first rapporteur on the rights of LGBTI persons. In 2016, she was appointed a commissioner on the WHO, PAHO-led independent review of equity and health inequalities in the Americas. Welcome, Ms. Robinson. Thank you so much. So let's start off by talking a little bit about yourself. So obviously you are a highly achieved human rights lawyer and you also call yourself a legal feminist. What brought you to a career in international human rights and how did you become a legal feminist? Maybe to, to talk about um, my understanding of myself as a legal feminist, um, I wouldn't describe it as a process of conversion. Um, you know, for me, feminism is very much the relationship between it and myself is how I've become who I am. Uh, so it's very much part of how I understand myself and have um, from all of my adult life. And I would say not, although there's not a single moment in which I can say I became feminist, my year at Yale Law School was foundational. And there I did courses with Vicki Schultz and Riva Siegel. And those courses were transformational for me and um, gave me an anchoring, which helped me to think about not only myself, but the work I wanted to do. To turn to your question also about human rights law, you know, I wouldn't think of myself as someone um, who's had a career in human rights law and more as someone who has had important opportunities. Um, I exist in many spaces professionally, and that's always been valuable to me, including those in international human rights law. But I'm, I would say I'm more outside of the space than I am in it. And I think that's true for an increasing number of international human rights actors. That's very interesting what you just said. Can you explain a little bit what you meant by how you felt that you were more outside of it rather than inside of it, um, considering that you spent such a successful and long career practicing in it? Because my everyday work is teaching Caribbean students and I'm teaching them domestic law. Uh, I don't teach international human rights law, for example, in the Caribbean. You know, I'm primarily a public law teacher, you know, in, in US terms, constitutional law, also some human rights law, but often operating in domestic courts. I teach family law as well. And um, so from that perspective, uh, certainly to the students I teach, um, although I'm teaching international human rights principles in the law I'm teaching, I'm not the primary teacher in that area. And then a lot of my work is within the Caribbean region where we rely heavily on international human rights principles, but um, we're functioning and operating in domestic spaces, in domestic courts, uh, working with domestic judges, lawyers who are often operating in domestic courts. So that's what I mean, that um, more of my work is in that space uh, than in the international human rights space. So as you have said it yourself, you have a lot of experience teaching students, including on a lot of domestic law subjects. Um, so you obviously a professor, a teacher, and at the same time, you have also, you know, played many different roles. Um, for example, you're also a writer, you write very extensively, you're a litigator, 
you also serve different roles with different international and regional organizations in different capacities. So of all these different roles that you've worked on throughout your career, is there any a particular role that is your favorite or is there a particular project that um, you're extremely proud of? I'm not sure what this will mean, <laughs> but working at home is the most valuable for me. I, you know, I think despite the work in the international human rights space um, in which the Americas became my region, no, I'm working on issues relating to Libya. Uh, I think the work within the Caribbean, and when I think of home, I think of the entire Caribbean region, working with colleagues um, who are also public law teachers, human rights teachers in the Faculty of Law UA Rights Advocacy Project, which you mentioned, that's mm -hmm. been the most rewarding. It's been the most rewarding, not simply because of what we end up doing, um, and I'm apologizing as I often have for dogs in the background. <laughs> you were asking me about where I am and I'm in Kingston, Jamaica, um, in a community where there are many dogs around. And um, I would say that work with judges or lawyers in court um, with students has made a difference to me, not only because of what it's done, but very much um, the process of working with colleagues who have cared equally and committed to working together. And the work has been, I think, humbling and instructive. I have throughout all of it um, been guided slowly on how to work better with others, with communities. And from that point of view, over a decade, that work has for me been the most rewarding. So from, from what you described, is my understanding correct that it is the work that you're currently doing um, that is deeply rooted in the region with your colleagues and within the community that is the most valuable to you at this moment? Is that a good understanding of it? It's a good way of thinking about it, but another way it could be, it's the work I've spent the longest time doing consistently. Um, so it's a space which I've inhabited with a community of others for the longest, serving the same communities for the longest periods of time. Uh, so from that perspective, I think it's, it's not necessarily that my work outside the Caribbean isn't equally important and valuable, but I've invested a lot more time here. So this actually, it, it segments very nicely to the next question that I want to ask, that is, because you've worked extensively within the Caribbean region and also outside of it, do you see any differences in the type of work that you do with the many different actors within and outside of the region? Let's say when you work within the Caribbean region versus you know, working on the international level, um, do you tend to operate with very different types of strategies set um, different priorities or adopt different style of advocacy based, based on the different actors? Um, is, is that something that you have observed in your work? You know, my roles have been different. <laughs> you know, so at some points I've been a consultant to international organizations and largely in the past, you know, in the more recent future, I've been part of independent mechanisms functioning within organizational spaces. Uh, for example, this new fact-finding mission or my time on the Inter-American Commission. When I'm in the Caribbean, um, I'm often in a much more direct advocacy role, um, acting on behalf of working very closely with um, NGOs and communities uh, facing human rights violations. I would say that the first thing I always try to do is to figure out what my role is, because that role changes. It's not the same. Um, the role may be clearly defined somewhere in a constitutive instrument, what I'm expected to do, but invariably um, there is more to what is expected that you have to carefully discern from your environment, um, from the dialogue which you have with others about why you're there and the importance of it. So I would say the thing I've taken to every part of the work which I do is the business of listening very keenly early. And I have taken into all of my work this idea that to make sense of who you are, 
in a particular place to figure out what you're meant to do, what really matters in the time you have, which is usually very finite, what are the interests at stake, you have to listen. And it's very difficult to listen when you're talking. And so often it does require some discipline um, to engage in the practice of quiet learning um, through listening. And I found it helpful, even when the expectation of others is that you should be able to hit the ground running right away. I've often stopped and paused um, to learn enough to be able to contribute meaningfully. Even after such a long career and experience that you have. Absolutely, because you're always being asked to function in new environments. Um, and there's a humility which you have to bring to the work because there's always a skill which you have, um, some knowledge which you would bring, but there's always a gap, always is a gap. And um, a, a big part of your role is discerning and responding to the gap, but that takes some quiet time and some careful understanding of the space first. That's very insightful. Like you said, to, to listen, to fully observe, and to understand what's really going on. Is this something that you would recommend every uh, more junior person or, or, or every student to, to acquire as an important skill? I think listening is, is key. I think, you know, so I think of my role in the Inter-American Commission as often listening to victims. Um, I often had a deep responsibility um, to faithfully not only hear, but represent um, through some process in the inter-American system, um, what happened to them and what it required to repair what happened to them. And so it's an integral part of many parts of human rights work. I would say it's more suited to my personality. I'm naturally an introspective person. Um, I, you know, and, and I certainly think I've met and worked with a range of persons who are ready to offer their thoughts early. Um, I've benefited from the quietness. It's disarming, including for you, as others are waiting to hear from you. Um, in the spaces in which I've worked, people are waiting to hear from you. And you may be trying to spend a moment to make sense. Um, it can't be a long moment, <laughs> uh, but I found it valuable. And I think others might. To follow up on that, do you think the ability and the capacity to listen, is it something that female lawyers tend to do relatively well? Um, I'm asking this because, you know, um, obviously this project is about women international law and we are very curious to hear about your view on women's experiences and, and practice as female lawyers in the field of international law. Yes, I, I, I do know that women so much have a natural instinct for this. I, I wouldn't want to suggest that. Um, and I might suggest the reason which is, which is um, a not entirely happy one, that many of us as women um, have to find our way, uh, have to clear space to be able to function and work. And um, some of that, that space clearing work is um, quiet work. Sometimes it can't be quiet work because we don't always meet spaces um, which intend to or wish to treat women as equals. Uh, so some of learning your environment is a responsiveness to environments which have not always happily included women or included women and many other uh, minorities um, as equals. 